So since I have been in oncology, which is a long time, there have been some holy grail targets. The RAS, uh, RAF MEC pathway, which we heard about this morning, uh, CMIC, which we heard about, and NMIC, um, the uh, anti-angiogenesis, the VEGF receptor pathway, and uh, the other big missing one is the PI3 kinase pathway. And we are very fortunate to have one of the true world experts on the de develop translational development of PI3 kinase inhibitors uh, for the treatment of malignancies um, and especially breast cancer. So without further ado, I'll introduce Dr. Jose Baselga um, to talk to us about that. So thank you very much, uh, Jeff and, and, and Bruce. Thank you very much for this invitation to be uh, here today uh, uh, presenting at this uh, wonderful symposium. Um, the field of uh, targeting PI3 uh, kinase, uh, uh, the pathway, uh, it clearly, I think, has uh, arrived to a moment in which uh, it's, it's happening and it's real. And I think we are making progress mostly uh, in breast cancer. Now, I'm, I'm sure that there are going to be other indications, uh, but uh, I'd like to focus my talk today uh, mostly uh, if in, in breast cancer, if I, if I may. Now, the, interestingly, we have been so focused in the field of breast cancer in HER2 positive disease and so focused in triple negative, and, and, and yes, these are formidable uh, challenges that we have in our day-to-day -day, uh, uh, care. But I'd like to put forward that perhaps where we need more advances uh, uh, in breast cancer today, and that's something that for all of us who've been working in breast cancer for many years, seems like the world upside down, is in ER positive disease. Uh, that's the subgroup of tumors where for the first time uh, activity was observed with therapies. We had hormonal therapies for the first time available. Uh, and, and, and we thought and, and, and that this was the, the, the disease type that we could make best uh, um, uh, contributions and, 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 and we could reach some more cures. Well, this is not the case. Today, uh, we can cure more patients with HER2 positive disease than with ER positive disease. And I think that ER positive is becoming almost a semi-orphan disease that we need more approaches. And that's why I think it's important that PIC kinase pathway. This is data from the Oxford overview showing that um, despite therapy with hormonal therapy, uh, recurrence and uh, breast cancer mortality is an issue. With available uh, therapies, we do decrease uh, risk uh, by a uh, sizable proportion. There's no question about that. But still, uh, as you can see from these graphs, uh, we have uh, a long, a long way uh, to go. And uh, this is what we need to really try to improve. So uh, still a proportion, uh, a significant proportion of patients that need uh, therapies because these patients are going to recur and, and they're going to have, uh, um, they're going to die from metastatic uh, disease. And that's where the PI3 kinase pathway comes, comes to play. Uh, this is perhaps the pathway that is most frequently mutated in, in, in breast cancer. And um, it does not, it is not the same for all uh, tumor subtypes. Uh, it is mutant in about one third the gene I'm talking about now, the PI3 kinase gene, uh, mostly the alpha mutations also, um, the, you have additional ones. Uh, this mutant about uh, a third of the cases, and now we have data from all the um, sequencing efforts that have been published in the last year in Nature by multiple groups, and the data is very consistent. So you have about one third of tumors that are ER positive that have mutations. And also, uh, quite frequently, in HER2 positive disease. And I will not touch upon HER2 positive disease today, but something that has been questioned um, frequently is, uh, does therapy with Herceptin, for example, uh, or with Lapatinib, for that matter, how these patients respond if they have HER2 amplification and at the same time they have PIC kinase mutation amplification? Uh, their work uh, by Rene Bernards and by our group uh, in the lab showing that, and in small series, showing that if uh, patients um, have tumors with PIC kinase mutations, they respond less to Herceptin and they respond less to Lapatinib. But until now, we did not have much data. Uh, we're going to be presenting uh, a plenary session at San Antonio. I'll be presenting the data from the Cleopatra study. That's the large pertuzumab herceptin trial. 
And we show very clearly that piercing kinase mutations confer a worse outcome in patients with HER2 positive disease. I think this is the first time we're going to show that. It's in a huge data set. We have over 800 patients. And I think that sets the stage, uh, at least in HER2 positive disease, to combine PI3 kinase inhibitors with HER2 therapies. I'm not going to touch upon that, but stay tuned for San Antonio because the data is quite, is quite strong. Now, uh, focusing back to ER positive disease, uh, uh, we know that there is a crosstalk uh, between the estrogen receptor and the PI3 kinase pathway mTOR. There are several uh, layers of evidence that that's the case. For example, mTOR1 um, activates uh, ER in a ligand independent fashion. So you have ER transcription that is driven uh, by S6, uh, totally independent on whether you have um, estradiol uh, in the preclinical setting or not, so clearly a true ER transcriptional activator. On the other hand, uh, if we have estradiol on board uh, in preclinical models, uh, there is a prevention on the apoptosis that is induced by PI3 kinase uh, mTOR blockade. So it's incomplete, the effect. You don't maximize the effect if you have estradiol there despite blocking the mTOR pathway. Uh, we have also gone over the frequency of hyperactivation. So I think uh, if we look at all this data, there's a lot of sense in trying to block both the PIC kinase mTOR pathway together with an anti-estrogen. When we started with all this, um, years ago, uh, we did not have uh, selective uh, or pan PIC kinase inhibitors, so the only thing we had in, in hand uh, uh, were um, rapamycin analogs, and that's what we studied. Uh, what I'm showing here is uh, uh, the phase two results from NCIC Canada, that's a study that was published in GCO. This is the most positive study um, reported with mTOR inhibitors as a single agent. And as you know, uh, phase two studies are, you have to be careful when you look at the data, uh, especially, you know, careers are on the line. So the guys here, if they get a good data, they get a paper published, they get promotion, etc. So there is an incentive, I would say, uh, for unbiased um, reporting of results. And even in that setting, the activity, uh, it's hard for us to, to read this slide. Maybe I did that on purpose. But um, the, the point is that uh, there were very few responses in uh, ER-positive patients. There were about three uh, in this trial. And again, this is the most positive. So I think it's safe to say that uh, Eberolimus, which is uh, a rapamycin analog, um, in this uh, setting of uh, metastatic disease, phase two, single agent, has very minimal activity. Now, what happens when you combine uh, Eberolimus with an anti-estrogen? And the first uh, proof of concept uh, was using a neoadjuvant model. That's a study that we published uh, uh, um, uh, three years ago now. It's hard to believe how time flies. Uh, and this was uh, a, a study in newly diagnosed patients with breast cancer, ear positive, and they were randomized to receive letrozole uh, plus drug 001, AKI Eberolimus, or Lytrosol plus placebo. Uh, therapy went on for uh, a total of 16 weeks. And importantly, we had biopsies on day 15 on everybody. And in the case of ER uh, therapies, the decrease in proliferation at day 15 is the best marker we have to um, correlate with uh, disease-free survival uh, down the line. So multiple neoadjuvant studies have shown that proliferation at day 15 is a good marker of an effect when you are studying an anti-estrogen therapy. And what you can see here, and, and I hope this is, um, this is a hard slide to present. If somebody has some suggestion on how to present this better, let me know, because I've been struggling with this slide myself. Uh, but anyway, uh, what you look here is that the de decrease in proliferation. So this is uh, uh, here to the left uh, are the tumors that stop proliferating. And the combination arm, 60% have uh, less than one, um, percent of uh, tumor positive by this natural algorithm of key 67 So that's a very, a very steep uh, decrease in proliferation as compared to, um, to letrozole alone. So basically, 60% uh, of tumors stop proliferating with the combination. That's quite dramatic. And that is what uh, led later on to the design of uh, a number of clinical trials. We designed a large phase three clinical trial. I'll show the data in a minute. But unbeknown to us, 
um, a group of nice French investigators did a small study on the site uh, called TANRAD, and this study has been published uh, in the JCO uh, uh, very recently. This was a study in patients with advanced uh, ER positive, HER2 negative breast cancer. All these patients had been treated with prior AI, either in the adjuvant or in the advanced disease setting. Small study, randomized phase two, 111 patients, and patients were randomized to receive tamoxifen with everolimus or tamoxifen alone. Again, randomized phase two, no placebo control, so a lot of warnings in the data interpretation, but still, I think it's something that is worth to look, and I like to present the data. And the data is here, look at the graph on the right, I think to me that's the most important one, and that is looking at progression-free survival. And what uh, they observed was a hazard ratio of, point by, of 0.54, and they observed a substantial increase in the time to disease progression. 4.5 months with tamoxifen alone, and they went up to 8.6 months with the combination. That's important because um, we'll see the data in Bolero now. It is very similar, uh, as, as you may be aware. And I think that when people in clinical practice ask, are asking, do the effects of epidolimus are just restricted to uh, an AI? My answer is based on this study is probably no. And, and perhaps as a class effect, I think it is. And I would have personally, I think that with Fulvestron it's gonna be the same outcome that with uh, tamoxifen and that with AI. So let's go to the Bolero study. That's the large uh, randomized registration study. This is, um, uh, uh, placebo controlled, uh, a two to one randomization. So everolimus plus examestin, plus examestin plus placebo. And the primary endpoint was progression free survival, although as a secondary endpoint is overall survival. Uh, patients were postmenopausal, uh, ER positive, HER2 negative, and they had uh, proven to be refractory to either letrozole or anastrozole. And the primary endpoint was progression-free survival, and that's um, what was expected, a 26% uh, risk reduction, that's a hazard ratio of 0.74. And um, we had this analysis with a cutoff uh, due to an interim analysis that we built in. And you know the data well, um, hazard ratio 0.43, that based on the local assessment, that's a primary endpoint, and we went from uh, 2.8 months to 6.9 months. And then if we go by the uh, central assessment, uh, the data remains. Uh, has a ratio of 0 0.36, 4.1 to 10.8 months. Now I'd like to show you some data that maybe you're not uh, so familiar with because it's not in the paper. And this is a paper that we are gathering that I think it's, it's interesting. So the issue that we did see a very small proportion of patients responding. I, I, I think perhaps in ear positive disease, uh, Resist criteria to look for response may not be a good way to, to look for activity of these agents. So if instead of using classical resist criteria, we were to use just looking at the volume of the tumors, what happens uh, volumetrically, then we realize two things. A, that we have a proportion of patients with examestin that do well, that have a nice volumetric reduction, so that's point number one. But then look also at the benefit that you achieve uh, with the addition of everolimus, then you have a huge proportion of patients that do have a decrease in the tumor size using uh, volume. So I think that's an important consideration to take into account. The second point that I found, and this was something that the reviewers had concerns, and many people have concerns, is the behavior of the control arm. They said, you see, your control arm did underperform what was expected in this patient population. And therefore, you have to be careful when you interpret the positive trial design. So I think this slide uh, reflects that this is not the case. What I put here up is the number of clinical trials with examestin in a similar patient population and see what is the reported progression-free uh, uh, survival. And I think it's quite similar, as you can see here across, ac across the board. So we're talking about similar uh, progression-free uh, survival. Now, in terms of uh, subgroups, uh, do we have any subgroup that do better or worse? 
uh, we uh, had this uh, analysis uh, performed and with different subgroups, these were uh, all pre-specified um, analysis, and we could not find something. I think that's important because people are, are, are saying, do you think this drug is gonna, uh, uh, combination is gonna be better in first line or in second line or, or, or in third line? And we don't know the answer to this, but I, I think that probably based on the data that we have, based on prior uh, hormone therapy, I think probably is going to be working at all uh, um, the, at, at all levels, first line, second line, uh, even in the adjuvant setting. And I think that's why um, uh, SWOG is starting an adjuvant trial with this therapy. Now, the other thing that is uh, a, a thing is that is this is this uh, combination um, active in patients with visceral disease? Because in clinical practice, um, our tendency has been and is to incorporate uh, chemotherapy in patients with ear positive disease that have visceral metastasis. Uh, I think this data shows that basically the benefit is the same. And there's clearly an effect in the bone as well. And this is data that we're gonna be uh, submitting for publication very, very soon, looking at the effects in the bone uh, only. And this, of all the groups, is perhaps the group that does the best of all. Uh, there's a huge benefit in patients with uh, bone metastasis uh, alone. Then um, we have uh, data between the younger and the uh, uh, older group. Um, again, benefit in both uh, age groups as well. And then um, this is uh, in terms of the response on the clinical data. Uh, uh, there was an update that we presented uh, showing consistently improvement in response and the clinical effect. I think the point about response is the one I already raised before, that I don't think that response is a good way to check uh, activity with these endocrine therapies. And this is uh, visceral uh, uh, metastasis. <coughs> and this is in patients without visceral metastasis. Now, survival. And I'm sorry I missed the discussion before about survival. Uh, this drug was approved without the survival benefit. And it's interesting because it was one of the first approvals that was submitted to the FDA after they claimed that they were not gonna approve any drug in breast cancer without survival. So after saying that, we went in with this as probably the first or the second study uh, just to challenge uh, the whole system, which we did. Uh, and and uh, uh, that's a good discussion. I think that if you have a very strong uh, progression-free survival data, as we did here, with hazard ratio in the range of 0.4, uh, probably survival, uh, there's no need for that. The data in survival is not mature. Uh, all these represent unspecified survival analysis because every time we went to the FDA or to the EMEA, they asked us to do something that if we had done spontaneously, we would have been uh, uh, reprimanded, uh, which is an, an unspecified uh, look at survival at different time points. And uh, basically, I think we're gonna probably uh, see a survival benefit down the line, but Again, it's very immature, as you see. The last cutoff we have is from uh, December uh, uh, last year, and I think we're gonna wait until we have all the data that we need to have a final survival uh, readout. Now, moving forward, um, we have uh, other compounds that are uh, uh, very uh, exciting. Uh, we have the pan pa 3 kinase inhibitors, uh, uh, that uh, there are multiple of them. As part of the standard to cancer, uh, we have been working with one compound called uh, BKM120, uh, and we have done um, a phase one B study of the combination with BKM uh, plus retrosol in patients with ER positive disease, looking at different schedules. This was presented at ASCO by Ingrid Mayer from Vanderbilt, again, part of the standard to cancer group. And what we observed, and I think that's the point here, is that we have a number of patients uh, with mutations and without ps kinase mutations that stay on disease, that, that stay on therapy uh, for a long time. We have seen some CRs, we have seen some PRs. So this is a strong signal to move forward. And uh, we are now um, undergoing, uh, uh, we're now uh, conducting uh, registration uh, phase three study called the BEL2. 
uh, that uh, study uh, has already enrolled, as of yesterday, uh, 70 uh, patients. Uh, this is in uh, combination with Fulvestran. This study has an interesting part in the design that I'd like to share with you because this is something that perhaps as we move forward we need to think uh, uh, and ways to do things. It is critically important with this class of agents to know if responses are better in patients with PI3 kinase mutations uh, or not. I think that's important. That's something that we need to know. How do you deal with that when the study is not being done at MGH, the study is being done around the world, uh, when you have multiple patients that have to come in from multiple sites, and there are sites that they don't do routinely PI3 kinase evaluation. So the way we did it uh, is as following. We say, if the patient fulfills the criteria to enter into the study, you have to send the blocks to us. And once we have the block at hand, so it's not that the block is on the mail. No, no, the block is, is, is with us. Uh, we've been there before, too. Uh, so the block is with us. Then there is, an, and the patient fulfills all the other criteria. So in this case, these are patients postmenopausal, AI uh, refractory, no more than one prior chemotherapy for advanced disease, et cetera, they have not received eborolimus or any other mTOR therapy. Then these patients, we have the block, they have a run-in period with the endocrine therapy. So it's not that you're waiting, because that's another thing. You cannot have a patient with metastatic disease waiting for a month or for 15 days until you have the result coming to you. It's not gonna happen. You cannot, you need, you need therapy. So you start therapy, run in. In the meantime, the screening goes on, so you have the data, and then about day 15, plus minus three days, based on the data that you have a mutations, then the patients are stratified and then they are randomized. So you ensure that you're gonna have data on PIC kind of mutation on both sides, on both arms, and they're gonna be comparable. So we'll see how this goes, but so far we are enrolling patients well, and I think it's gonna work. Total number of patients that we want is 842, and at least three, uh, 330, uh, 300, I'm sorry, a little bit over 300, are gonna, keep, are gonna be having PSD kinase uh, mutation. So we're gonna be able to answer this question. The other thing that we learned is that there are, um, when you block mTOR or you block PSD kinase, there's a lot of compensatory talk. This is work by Neil Rosen, work by Jeff Engelman here at MGH. So multiple labs have been working uh, on this, our lab as well. And uh, we observed this in our initial clinical trial in 2008, when we block mTOR, we had an activation of uh, AKT. And we then conducted a clinical trial with an anti-IGF-1 receptor agent, because I have not mentioned to you that the mechanism by which this occurs is via activation of a negative, uh, or release of a negative feedback loop upon the IGF-1 receptor. And in the clinical trial, we used an antibody against the IGF-1 receptor, and we observed that we were able to silence uh, uh, IGF-1 receptor uh, signaling in this, in this clinical study. And that led to a follow-up uh, clinical study uh, that we combined uh, an mTOR inhibitor with an IGF-1 receptor antibody. I will not go through that. We have a lot of preclinical data that suggests that luminal B breast cancer may be dependent on IGF-1 receptor uh, signaling. I think that's important. In the lab, if you do um, um, enhancer screens, uh, mTOR is always a top hit in IGF-1 receptor uh, 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 enhancer screen antibodies. The, the reverse holds true, so there's a lot of rationale in the lab to study this combination. And to make a long story short, we conducted a phase one study uh, on the combination of an mTOR inhibitor plus an IGA-1 receptor, showing a, a, a very uh, profound activity. Again, this is a phase one study. So we had 43% of patients uh, with breast cancer that showed uh, uh, some level of activity, and 54% of those patients with luminal B had response. So the data was so good that uh, Many people did not believe it. We are in a field, and when we have good data, we don't believe it. We are, uh, uh, we are so used to sometimes uh, through the hardship of obtaining. So what we have done now is that we have done a randomized phase two study 
uh, looking at this combination, uh, some of the patients have been from MGH, actually a lot of patients, Bev Moy has been uh, seeing the patients as well as myself, and we have confirmed that this combination is quite active, and now we have launched a randomized phase two uh, study, large study, uh, that hopefully will address the uh, role of this combination together with um, an anti-estrogen. So what we're doing is that we are combining, in this case, the mTOR inhibitor plus an AI versus the IGF-1 receptor antibody plus the mTOR inhibitor plus the AI. I think that study is going to be positive based on what we've seen in our phase two study here. So that's quite exciting. And then uh, the other thing that is happening now is that we have uh, uh, isotype-specific inhibitors uh, that we are also studying. The top three are being studied uh, here at, at MGH. And I'll just present data on the first uh, one of them, and that's um, a BYL. Uh, I'll just pass this quickly. Um, P110 alpha mutations are frequent in breast cancer. They are important, as we have seen. And uh, these compounds are very selective against the isotype, the alpha isotype. This is data from BYL 719. Look at the um, IC50 uh, in the wild type alpha and in the uh, most frequent uh, 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 mutations. Uh, compare this to beta, compare this to uh, mTOR. So there's a, a big selectivity that's important. And in work in cell lines uh, done uh, by Novartis, this is Novartis data, and also in work done here by Cyril uh, um, uh, at MGH, uh, there is clear correlation between mutational status and sensitivity to this compound in preclinical models. Here on the left, you have a panel of uh, mutant uh, cell lines, and in 74% of the cases, uh, there is high level of activity in, in the lab. Uh, now, not all the um, wild type are, are resistant, they are not. So about 31% of the uh, cell lines that have mutant uh, PA3 kinase, they're sensitive. And those include the HER2 positives, very sensitive. Those include those cells that have PA3 kinase mutations. And this include clearly other markers that we don't know yet. But I think it's important to focus on the 74 that are sensitive. So based on this, uh, we started uh, here a phase one clinical study. Uh, looking at the safety of the combination, but importantly, from day one, we only entered patients with PI3 kinase alpha mutations. And I think that's a defining moment in the uh, development of agents against PI3 kinase inhibitors. The data was presented by uh, Dan Jurek, a fellow at that time at the ACR meeting last year. He is going to be presenting an update in San Antonio uh, this year. Great data, I cannot tell you if you are interested either talk to them or go to San Antonio. Uh, but bottom line is that um, uh, th there was a lot of activity seen in these patients. Interestingly, uh, 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 the, uh, the activity is not all the same in the different tumor types. And this is going to be the basis for the San Antonio presentation. Again, go there. <laughs> uh, but not alpha mutations. It's not the same. So a colon cancer with an alpha mutation does not have the same outcome that a breast cancer patient with a PIV kinase alpha mutation. So this is something that if we develop these agents, we will have to, to, to be thinking uh, about that. To show the activity, so just to show the activity is real. <coughs> now, uh, what, what are we doing next? What, what's, uh, so I think what we're doing next is to combine these agents with anti-estrogens in breast cancer. Uh, we had a number of patients in the phase one setting that we knew from past history and from knowing them that they were very hormone sensitive. And if the same story that mTOR applies, and, and I'm sure it will, uh, uh, then it makes much more logical sense to combine anti-estrogen. This is work done by a medical student in my lab, uh, uh, Jesse Tao, um, combining uh, fulvestrin and BYL in a breast cancer model. And the point here, and that's a busy slide, and this is not working any longer. The, the, I'll try to. So anyway, the combination is far better, so that's important. Look at this red line. So these are um, animals that are being treated initially with the anti-estrogen alone, and then at one point, uh, the BYL is being added, and you see an extra effect. So I think that's nice. So not only the combination is better, 
but at any given time, if you add uh, the PIC kinase inhibitor, you get an extra kick and you have uh, more uh, tumor inhibition. And based on this data and others, uh, the phase one study of BYL now is being expanded and we have a cohort of uh, BYL plus fulvestrin. I spoke with Diane this morning and see how many patients had he entered and he said none because the protocol is not active yet, uh, but it should be active pretty soon. So hopefully we will have these uh, 20 uh, patients uh, coming, coming in. When we try to do the same as we did in the past, try to see what is the crosstalk uh, when we treat with BYL or when we treat with BKM and the ER. Uh, we have done a lot of uh, 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 gene expression uh, arrays uh, looking at BYL under different uh, circumstances. And I'm gonna show you one point that I think is interesting. Whenever we treat with BYL, we see an increase in ER levels. Again, speaking to the crosstalk and to the need perhaps to block both. This is data in multiple cell lines based on the gene expression uh, findings that we had in a totally um, uh, unsupervised uh, 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 fashion. And even in animals, if we look at the tumor xenographs and we look for ER levels in tumors that are being treated with uh, BYL, we do see, and I hope you see on the top on the top uh, lane, um, you will see that the BYL staining of ER is clearly uh, stronger than uh, in the control animals. And when we treat with the combination uh, of uh, fulvestrin, we decrease that. So uh, we believe that if that holds true, it would be important to combine not only anti-estrogen, but perhaps estrogen receptor degrading agents. And we have a number of compounds that are gonna start the clinic that are fulvestrin, or if you wish, even better fulvestrins uh, to, be, to be checked. I'm finishing. Uh, I don't know how much time do I have left. Do I have a few more minutes? Okay, so uh, I'd like to uh, uh, give you one last uh, little story. Uh, the when we began to work with BKM, uh, we had um, some responses in patients with triple negative, triple negative breast cancer. And we did, not we did not understand very well what was going on. Uh, but then what we realized in the lab is that PIV kinase inhibition does induce DNA damage, uh, both in vitro and in vivo. Um, here on the uh, right, uh, we were looking at gamma uh, H2 uh, AX, and, and showed that with BKM therapy, we clearly see an increase in DNA damage. Unbeknown to us, or to me, uh, I was talking to Liv Allison one day about this and say, and he told me, yeah, I've had this data for a long time. Uh, and so when we were writing the paper, uh, this data on the left, uh, it's coming from Liv's lab in which he had shown, you know, again, for a long time and he had the data there, that uh, uh, with sRNA, uh, uh, there is an increase also in uh, gamma uh, H2AX, uh, suggestive of DNA damage. So PFC kinase inhibition does induce. So that opens then the gates for a number of, compli uh, of, of combinations, right? Um, with agents that may interfere uh, 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 or that might promote uh, DNA uh, damage. So, in our uh, system, what we uh, uh, did is that we began to uh, work uh, in combination with uh, PARP inhibitors. Uh, this is uh, data from the paper that we just published in Cancer uh, Discovery as part of the Standard to Cancer group. And what we uh, found, and I think that's uh, important, and you can see here on the top uh, graphs, is that we showed that in triple negative breast cancer, uh, PFC kinase inhibition um, induces DNA damage, and it does also um, induce uh, a reduction in the levels of BRCA2 and BRCA1. So maybe um, there's a mechanism here. You have a decrease in the levels of BRCA1 and 2, and therefore these cells cannot repair DNA as well as they would in normal conditions. And that sets the stage for the combination of uh, PARP inhibitors with um, uh, PIC kinase inhibitors. And a clinical trial has been started uh, with this combination as part of standard to cancer. Now, the data that is even more dramatic than ours is the data from um, Wolf and Luke Canley uh, here at the BI, 
uh, in uh, they, they are working here uh, in, a, uh, in, in, in a model that is a BRCA uh, mutant model. And uh, these are tumors that grow very, very fast, extremely aggressive, as you can see. These, these animals die uh, very rapidly due to tumor growth. And, and look at what they are seeing. They are seeing uh, basically the tumors disappear in full uh, when the, uh, you combine a PIC kinase inhibitor plus um, plus a, a, a PARP inhibitor. So very exciting. And in that clinical trial, we're also going to have uh, that uh, cohort in combination in patients uh, with BRCA uh, deficiency. So uh, in summary, uh, what I have portrayed to you today is that Everolimus, uh, an mTOR inhibitor, uh, clearly prolongs progression free survival in patients with ER positive HER2 uh, negative uh, uh, breast cancer. So I think this is something that is going to become a, a standard of care. And our goal for the next few years is to expand this observation beyond second line. So what's happening in the first line setting, what's happening in the adjuvant setting with mTOR inhibition. I haven't touched upon the biomarkers. We have tumor blocks on everybody on this trial. So we are working with Foundation Medicine, and we're going to have a, hu um, a, a whole um, a mutational profile of these tumors and be able to know um, if there are any mutations that predict persistence or sensitivity to this combination. I am very excited about the IGF-1 receptor mTOR combination. I think the data is promising. and looking forward to see the results of the randomized phase two. The pump kinase inhibitors have shown uh, modest but real clinical activity, and uh, there are some combinations that I've showed that are uh, also uh, quite promising. And then we have the data on the isotype-specific uh, PIF kinase alpha inhibitors. I did not cover two compounds that were on one of my slides. One was GDZ0032. Suffice it to say that there is uh, a lot of activity with this compound as well. And it will be presented by Dr. Jurik at AACR uh, this, uh, this year. So it's not going to be just one compound. We have more than one company, one compound from different companies showing um, activity. And then the last concept is that in triple negative breast cancer, PRC kinase inhibitors don't regulate uh, BRCA expression, and they are synergistic uh, when combined with PARP inhibitors, and uh, clinical trials are ongoing with this. So I'd like to acknowledge, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, my lab. Um, uh, you've seen some of these names as we went uh, 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 ahead in the presentation. I'd like to thank in particular uh, Maori Scaltriti, the guy with the pink shirt. Uh, he is moving uh, to Sloan Kettering uh, 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 with me. Um, you've seen the data of Jesse Tao, that's a medical student. Is hiding somewhere uh, in in the picture next to next to uh, Maori and some other people also that are listed and then of course uh, the breast group at MGH uh, led by Bev uh, Moy um, uh, with Steve uh, Isakov Aditya who is going to be uh, being the local PI for the Bell to study um, both at MGH and other than a farmer and then uh, Kerry uh, Masman uh, who is um, medical oncology fellow, and he, she, he's uh, running herself a whole set of uh, uh, clinical trials, first in human, um, and then, of course, uh, Luke Canley and Neil Rosen and Sarat at M um, uh, MSKCC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose, for a uh, truly whirlwind tour through a very complicated area. So can you just very briefly, uh, it's a huge area, but briefly touch on resistance and what types of studies globally are ongoing to address that question? Yeah, so resistance, that's a, 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 a big, so the problem with resistance is that in the, until now, um, in the single agent studies, we did not have many patients to be able to study, so let's, I'll, I'll get to you in, in a minute. Um, with the Bolero 2, we have tissue blocks on the majority of patients, and we have done the foundation medicine um, panel. And I've seen the data in terms of the mutations. I have not seen the clinical correlation yet, but I'm confident that we're going to be able to um, study at least some of the obvious things that could induce resistance, such as cycling D amplification, I guess, or um, some uh, mutations that 
may uh, interfere with uh, the mTOR pathway. So we're going to have data from that. That's one thing. The other thing that we have been doing here uh, with Dan and with Maori and with people at the press group is that we have had a very active program at obtaining tumor biopsies uh, at baseline and, and then at progression. Uh, so we have now a number of patients that have responded in which we have the tumor not only at the time they, they entered into the trial, but at the time they progress. And those uh, samples will have to undergo deep sequencing. And, 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 and then we'll get some idea on, on that. Uh, that would be wonderful if we could get some uh, I, I, I idea. Uh, now, uh, uh, just to finish the comment, uh, I think there are two ways you can focus your work on. In, one is identify what are the mechanisms of resistance. That's, one, that's the first thing we did. Let's talk about resistance. And then we are like stepping back and let's perhaps, the way to do it that would be easier would be let's try to understand those that respond that well. And we were inspired by the data of David Solid um, in Everolimus in bladder cancer. He had that patient that had this amazing response and he went in and he did sequencing and he found the TSC uh, one mutation. So I think that's something that, um, so what we're focusing now with BYL and with the other compounds is to try to understand if we could those that respond uh, dramatically well. So along the same line, uh, could, you, could you please comment on, are those ER relapse tumors still dependent on ER or its signaling pathway for survival? Or is there any uh, escaped growth pathway uh, induced in um, like acquired resistance? PI3 kinase for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so that applies as well. Um, the, the issue is where to study that because that, that becomes so that becomes so complex. Uh, what we are doing is that we are embarking on a large, on two large neoadjuvant studies in patients with ER positive disease. And hopefully we are gonna be able to establish correlations with proliferation. Because if we look at response, we can't, right? I mean, response rate is so limited that we're gonna miss that. So uh, we're gonna be launching, as part of the Press International Group, two large neoadjuvant studies. One is with uh, BKM, and that's about to start. And the other one will be with zero, uh, GDZ 0032 from Genentech in alpha mutant uh, ER positive patients. Uh, 